Hello everyone. So today we're going to talk about code switching, pigeons and creoles. By pigeons, we're not going to mean birds. We're going to talk about the linguistic notion of uh, pigeons. Um, actually, the world is multilingual. Most people on the planet speak multiple languages and they choose the appropriate language depending on the conversation they're in. But sometimes they will mix the languages when they're speaking, especially when there's um, in a situation where each language has an equal footing or some related form about its use. It's not just word borrowing, which of course happens a lot, especially when you're in a situation where you don't really have a word in the language and it's easier to take a word from the other language to describe things. You also get shared grammar and morphology too. So when you're actually mixing, it's not just word borrowing. It's often a lot more than that. Um, we call this code switching. It's sometimes called code mixing as well. I don't distinguish between these two terms. Some people try to do it and they have definitions that are valid and they are consistent in how they use them. But I will use these terms interchangeably and so do lots of other people use these terms interchangeably. Um, it should be pointed out that even for monolinguals, they actually do code switching as well. Um, it's often what we might be called register shifting between, say, dialects. So, for example, I'm a speaker of Scots English and Standard English. And if I'm in Scotland talking to Scottish people, I will float pretty fluently between each of these languages. And somebody external to understanding Scots will understand a lot of what's going on because there's a lot of overlap. But occasionally there'll be phrases and words and even grammatical forms that are unusual um, to them. Um, if you're still not sure about that and think you only speak one language and don't have any uh, um, other forms, uh, the example I give is think about swearing. Okay, swearing is a very different register of, of um, speech and you can speak with swearing or not swearing and you make decisions about whether you're going to include it or not or you've been in conversations where other people do that. So they may speak perfectly normally and then they'll drop into some other form to swear or use some other co colloquialism in order to make a point or make a distinction. And that's arguably um, code switching as well. Um, sometimes that mix becomes standard and pigeons are defined as being a non-native language. So there's no native speakers of it and it's a shared language. But it's often a simplified mix of multiple languages. Traditionally, it's often come through trade. So there's some trade groups and they're trying to communicate with each other and nobody has a common language. And so they start borrowing from both sides. And so you can see these languages for the world, especially where there was colonial, both European colonial and elsewhere. Um, and pigeons sort of um, grow out of necessity. Um, they're usually not learned at school or anything like that but they actually become somewhat standardized. And after a while, these standardizations actually develop such that people become native in them because in the city, it's worthwhile to speak this pigeon, this communication, this lingua franca, and they actually generate into creoles where they've still got a mixed aspect and um, a, a, they become a native language in themselves. And there's lots of good examples of where um, Creoles have developed into pretty much um, standard form. So let's actually look at some uh, um, examples of this. Creoles have native speakers, pigeons do not yet ish, although the exact definition becomes uh, a little bit um, uh, hard to give. Also, these terms can be very politicalized. Um, sometimes people consider pigeons just to be bad speech and therefore not worthy of consideration because properly educated people would, of course, speak the King's English or the Queen's English, depending on the time that it actually happened. Um, uh, but of course, that's just uh, pompous nonsense. Um, the, the, that definition becomes not clear. And much more importantly, um, we don't change the name of the language when it be suddenly becomes a Creole after a three-year-old passes a test as being a native speaker, because uh, that would be hard to actually evaluate. Um, but uh, uh, we, um, uh, the terms will get used, but be aware that Creoles are typically been around for longer than what pigeons have. Um, I've got some examples here. Um, Jamaican Patois is often called a Creole. In fact, it's a good example of a Creole. Sometimes it's called the dialect of English. And um, here we've got an example from the Bible. 
Um, and uh, although if you look at all that text, you might think, eh, it's really weird, I can't actually understand it. But if you're an English speaker and I play it, and try, if you try to follow along with it, you'll discover that you actually understand quite a lot of it. And you might argue that it's just an English dialect, a hard English dialect to understand. Um, and so here we have things like 14 generations, okay? Um, uh, notice that there's not 14 generations, okay? Because often things get simplified. So in uh, Jamaican Patois, um, a, a agreement and a pluralization actually disappears. Um, and that's a good example. That's a probably well-performed example. Um, uh, Haitian Creole is another example of, um, again, with European influence. It has a lot of French influence in it. It also has some English influence in it. Um, uh, this, in spite of having Ishmael in it, um, is not from the Bible. It's actually from another data set that I actually have. And uh, let's display this. Zebadia, petit Ismael, la chef branche famille Jida, va picouji pour tout ça qui en rapport avec la loi pays. Um, uh, it probably sounds French, it probably sounds African French to you if you uh, understand it, but there's definitely some words in there that you'll understand. This is famille, family, okay? We have the word branch, which I don't think is in um, uh, French directly. Um, the, here we have the word petite, uh, small. Um, uh, notice that the writing system is much more phonetic than standard French. Um, uh, but Haitian Creole has millions of speakers. It's standardized. It has a writing system. It gets taught at school as a primary language. Um, even though it has a large influence from French, many people, especially educated people in um, uh, Haiti, have um, uh, speak French. Um, uh, but it's another example of a Creole. In fact, actually, its name in its own language is Creole. Um, English. English is arguably a Creole or a code switched language. It's code switch between Saxon and Norman French. Arguably the grammar is mostly Germanic, Saxon, although not always. We have some things that are um, uh, Norman French, while a lot of the lexicon comes from Norman French. Now, admittedly, most of this happened six to 800 years ago. Um, so speakers of the language don't think about it like that. Even full native speakers, it would be hard if you ask them, unless they're linguistically trained, to actually know which words are French and which words are uh, native. Though actually, um, native um, Saxon, though actually native speakers sort of can identify that and know when it's sort of a posh word and know when it's sort of a base fundamental word. They have that. And that distinction is often Saxon versus um, Norman French. Um, we don't think about English like that anymore. But there are definitely things in English that are like that. And there's even people who try to make a romance um, English, which um, has got much more French in influence, and people who try to make a, um, a Saxon English, which has no or little to no um, uh, um, Latinic words in it. And you know they're mostly understandable, but immediately you see where the difference, are, difference is actually happen. So if you're not familiar with other languages, this is sort of a reasonable thing to um, consider. Notice that um, uh, pigeons and creoles really are linguistic terms. We're talking about the linguistic description. And um, the political and social terms for these are non-trivial. And you can't just make claims about, oh, it's a creole, OK, without having somebody's army invade you, OK? So be aware that you have to be quite careful when you're talking about these things because people can sometimes be very upset both ways you know this is really my language and or this is really not a language this is just casual speak and you shouldn't be investigating it because it's not right if you ask somebody to give an example of code switching they think oh i have to perform and then they end up not doing it or pigeon because they try to perform to be proper whatever that means and that then that becomes bbc english or um uh, madrid um uh, castilian um spanish i don't think anybody does that with the spanish but that would be funny 
Um, uh, but they, they will tend towards absolute standard form because they think they're being tested and they think that there's some lack of education. They uh, may think that, or they may not think that. They actually might be super proud of it and therefore will go more into dialect or into their pigeon when they're asked to be able to do it. So be very much aware of this. Um, be aware that this is pretty standard and this has been around for at least thousands of years and, and probably forever since we've been able to speak. When you're speaking in a formal form, you're going to be much more standard because you're probably talking to a larger group of people and therefore you have to have much more of the, the um, standardized way of speaking. And be also aware that in all languages and some more than others, there is a strong distinction between speech communication and writing. We've only had writing since maybe 3000 years and for a long time, most people didn't write. And much more importantly, writing was a language that was different from what speaking was. Even if they were technically the same language, how you speak is very different from how you write. I mean, think of the distinctions that in Europe, um, Latin was the standard written form and people didn't even think about writing down whatever the local language was because why would you do that when you're writing you write Latin when you're speaking you speak whatever it is Saxon or often they would talk about as vulgar Latin and um, that word vulgar now has a negative um, uh, connotation but that's not why it was called vulgar it means um, basically the people spoken from um, and it's not supposed to have this negative form, but that vulgar Latin developed into Italian, French, um, Spanish, um, Catalan, etc. cetera. Um, so this actually makes it typically hard to find examples of pigeons, creoles, code switching in any formal form. You're not gonna find it in Wikipedia. You're not gonna find it in um, newspapers. You may find it in people who are proud of their heritage but again that might not be how people actually speak it's how people are supposed to speak and so um for example um the scots language which has disappeared over the last two three hundred years as people got better at writing and communication standard the most of the accents in the uk but um uh, particularly the rural ones and although there was a resurgence of uh, scots poetry and literature in the early 20th century it was sort of made up by a bunch of people who were claiming this is what Scots was and therefore it's not the same as what you know my grandfather actually spoke um, because he spoke what he spoke um, and therefore that was different from what um, uh, Hugh McDermott who was one of the famous, famous poets was doing there was an influence but it was not the same you could argue that code switching is a pre-pigeon um, because it may become a pigeon and it may actually also become a Creole or it may just you know, influence the language. I mean, we already um, uh, saw influence of Sanskrit words on lots of the Indian languages, including the Northern Indic and the Southern Dravidian languages in, in the language in tens in the past couple of weeks. Um, and uh, that um, uh, um, Sanskrit influence of both words and multi-word uh, phrases sometimes end up being um, uh, concatenate into complex um, uh, words, uh, compound words, um, has an influence almost in the same way that Latin does in, um, in most of the European languages. Um, English is moving into these languages as well. At the moment, we talk about those as code switching. Uh, long term, that's probably what Hindi, Telugu, uh, Canada are going to be. They're just going to have a lot of English in them, but probably still um, uh, very strong aspects of the original um, uh, in regional languages. Um, code switching is usually done between speakers of equal fluency, so that doesn't mean that they speak both languages equally fluency, fluent, but the people that are speaking um, have the same fluency for the two languages. Um, it's typically in casual speech or text, and text really means casual text, which means probably uh, social media. It's probably face to face. It's not broadcast. I mean, it might be in interviews where people are deliberately trying to be casual. Um, it's how people would speak. It's how people would send um, short messages on um, Twitter. But if they're standing up in front of a class giving a lecture, they're unlikely to do it. They may do it sometimes, but they're unlikely um, to do it. They probably don't feel that's right. If they're writing an essay, 
especially one that's going to get published, they're probably not going to do it. And they're going to move into, you know, if we're talking about English, they're going to move into Hindi or English. Um, uh, so it's sort of throwaway casual speech. And that, of course, makes it harder for us to study. Um, uh, we uh, often talk about what's called the matrix language in code switched form. And that's really sort of defining the major word order. Um, and uh, it's, it's easier to define where the two languages that you're dealing with um, have substantially different word orders. So Hindi and English are a good example. Hindi is mostly um, subject object verb and English is mostly subject verb object. And so where you have the verb at the end um, in English, which is actually the most common form, um, but you have lots of borrowed words and phrases, um, the matrix language would be um, a Hindi, but where you have basically English word order, but you have lots of borrowed words in Hindi, then you would call the matrix language English. It's not always easy to identify. Um, uh, and also short phrases actually flip. Um, so it's not unusual in a Hindi matrix um, order to end up with um, English order in some of the phrases, some of the noun phrases, because that's easier to actually do, especially if you've got certain particles like off in there. Um, we can also measure the amount of code switching. We could do it just on the percentage of from each language, but that doesn't really get what's going on because there's a difference between the first half being English, the second half being Hindi. Um, I, I'll often use um, Hindi English as, as the example. I don't just mean Hindi English, and we'll talk about other ones in a minute. Um, uh, um, but, but having the first half being one language and the second half being the other would have the same percentage of mix as if it was every alternate word. And of course, that's quite different. There are other measures that will actually allow us to talk about how often um, we change. And that's actually a little bit more interesting, probably. OK, but then it actually depends on the type of code switching. When we look at Spanish English, there's a tendency to do some um, word borrowing. And then there's full phrase um, uh, code switching, while actually in English, it's much more common to do much more complex things. This might be because of the fluency of, of the, the joint fluency of people, um, English speakers. They're usually very fluent in both languages, while in um, Spanish English, often they're not. They have a preference language, often, but it's sort of hard to really know. It also depends on the amount of data that you're actually looking at, the type of data that you're actually looking at. Um, Let's talk about some of the major dialects that people are actually studying and ones that are actually there. Sometimes it's between the local and the global language. There may be a dominant um, a larger language. It might be a language of education while the other one is a language of home. Um, that will often encourage um, code switching. It will also encourage people to be fairly fluent in both. Um, and when they're talking about shared things between home and um, outside, they might be more likely to do code switching. Um, but it's much more complex than that. Almost anywhere where there are multi-languages available in our community, there's going to be some form of code switching. Um, major ones that actually have names of their own, so Hinglish um, is Hindi and English. It's very common among educated young Hindi speakers. Um, if you go into older Hindi speakers, they may be less fluent in English. Um, a, I'm sure that the um, Hindi speakers in the audience now are aware that they have to try to use more Hindi when spoken, speaking to their grandparents. Um, but it depends because sometimes the grandparents are just as fluent in English. It depends on what their education was at the time. Um, a, but people doing, and there's maybe something to do with hip and aware and knowing what culture is and with internet that you would have more English in it. There's definitely more American English throughout the world now than what there was 50 years ago, thanks to movies and TV and um, social media. Chinglish is a mixture of Chinese and English, most commonly formed in Singapore, where again, you have um, strong fluency between these two languages. Hong Kong has it as well, but between Cantonese and uh, um, uh, English as well. Um, mainland China doesn't really, and I know that all the Chinese students in the audience do this all the time when they're at CMU because they're pretty fluent in both languages and none of them really know what the Chinese is for 
statistical gradient descent. Um, I'm sure it has something, but um, I know some Chinese lecturers who have to look it up and try to find out what the Chinese is for that. So there's certain things and, you know, things like Squirrel Hill is not going to be translated. Um, but in uh, Singapore, there is the Chinese speakers are very fluent to both and they just randomly mix them, which is interesting because it's tonal versus non-tonal and they have to do things. In the US, um, there is a large number of Spanish speaking um, areas of the US where people are pretty much fluent between English and um, uh, Spanish. So Southwest California, um, Arizona, there are large numbers of people who are fluent in both and they'll mix them. Again, it's sort of a young thing, but maybe it's not just a young thing. Maybe it's actually just a casual thing. New York is um, very um, uh, um, mixed as well. And I remember going to a meeting in New York once where the expectation was that you spoke Spanish. You didn't have to speak it well, but when they played examples in Spanish, nobody translated for you, which is hard for a Brit. I mean, maybe a Brit would do that with French. There's an expectation that most Brits have some working knowledge of French, um, but definitely in New York, there's a sort of assumption that everybody, um, uh, even white Anglo-Saxons, know some Spanish. Um, but there's also a very large population who are fluent in both. Uh, Puerto Rico um, is effectively bilingual, and there is lots of code switching there, and it's extremely common. And New York has lots of Puerto Ricans, so it's not um, uh, um, unusual to see that. And um, should also mention African American English. African American English is what you might think about as Black English, um, and Standard American English is what you think about as maybe white, but actually what we're really talking about is broadcast. Um, uh, it's very common in the US for black communities to do code switching between African American English and standard English, depending who they're talking to and what they're talking about. And in fact, if you look up um, uh, things about code switching and um, uh, code mixing, you'll often find linguistic studies about African American English and how people switch. Um, uh, um, so that's pretty common. Um, uh, in all of these ones, I, actually, when I was selecting those, you know, I said local and global, um, but look at Hindi English, Hindi English, Chinese, Spanish. They are all in the top um, five languages on the planet. And I think, well, what's the missing one? And I think Arabic is the, um, is the next one, unless it's Bengali, um, which also has lots of mixing. Um, uh, Arabic is lots of mixing as well, sometimes with English, but actually most often with dialects of um, uh, Arabic. So it's not just local and global, it's uh, everything is doing it. And as we move further down the most frequently spoken languages, we'll find a lot more. Um, when do people code switch? Um, sometimes it's the vocabulary thing. So, you know, if you're talking about machine learning, you're going to use English words because it's sort of new special meaning. If you're talking about food, you're probably going to talk about that in Hindi, especially if it's Indian food and you're not going to translate um, uh, um, aloo into potato because aloo is a perfectly reasonable word for potato. And in fact, if you use the word potato, it sort of means English cooking of potatoes. Okay, overly boiled. Um, a, also, there's, you know, if you're talking about relationships, um, uh, something that's a little bit more sentimental, something closer to you, a little bit more family, you might go into the regional language. If you're talking about things which use English, which often is studying and education, you might use English for that. Um, it sort of depends, but definitely there may be a prior on which language you use when talking about different topics, okay? Um, there's also a, a notion of showing off or trendiness. Um, it can be often good to use fashionable English words. I mean, this is true in English as well. You want to use the hip words, and I'm pretty sure the word hip hasn't been used since the 1950s, um, uh, but I still use it, um, and I'm sure you still know what it means. Um, but also, it might be that you want to show off that you know about the local culture, Okay, so that you use ethnic words to be able to describe things like food and culture, because you want to refer to that part of the culture rather than maybe a more genetic word. I mean, this can happen within a language as well, where you're going to use a, a, a more standard um, popular word than a more scientific word, for example, um, because that gets the meaning that you actually want to um, do. Um, uh, so this displaying affiliation to a group, 
um, you might want to, people might want to show that they are educated or they might want to show their roots. If I'm talking to a Scottish person, I'm going to flip into use Scottish words so I can pretend to still be Scottish. Um, uh, while if I'm, uh, um, and I know I do that when I'm talking to Americans, I um, often pick the American um, word rather than the British English or Scots English word because, well, they wouldn't understand it. Um, and I don't need to show off that I'm Scottish because I'm um, comfortable with the position that I'm in. Um, it has been shown um, uh, by a bunch of people at Microsoft, including um, Shruti um, Rajwani, who's a PhD student here now, um, that there's more sentiment in the native language compared to the uh, other language. This was looking at English, so native language was Hindi. Um, and people actually might be more truthful or more open um, in their uh, native language. And maybe that's because, actually not because they're more native, it's because they're, they're um, more truthful. They're talking to their friends and you're more likely to be open to your friends than if you're broadcasting things. So there's probably something going on there and that makes it actually quite important, okay? Um, I'm gonna have to go faster. Um, entrainment, people will copy what also happens. And it might also to get distinction. So there might be simple semantics going on or maybe just opinion um, uh, when you're talking about it. Newspapers, Wikipedia will typically not be code switched. Um, uh, and so NLP uh, of non-standard language is something should we really care about? But code switching is how people actually communicate. So that's why we care about it. people typing questions to Google or Bing using it. Um, they talk at call centers using it. Um, they write their actual opinions using it. They use code switching, uh, can define group membership. And if you don't do it, it's hard to be part. It's hard to be able to take the thing that's serious or be a member. Um, uh, people trust more because it's probably more localized. And even if they know it's fake and coming from a machine, they know that at least somebody cared about um, uh, um, localization in order to be able to do it. And therefore they trust it more because they said somebody cared about that. So Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, all want to be able to understand and generate um, code switch data. Why is it hard? Well, there's very little data um, available. Um, uh, often code switch data is removed from data sets. So people will do question answering and they'll remove everything that hasn't got all English in it or all Hindi because, well, we don't want to deal with that. So it's actually actively um, uh, avoided. Or if you're actually collecting data, people stop doing that because they're told just use one language. And so people don't use code switched when they're doing it. Um, because it's casual, it's incredibly noisy. Spelling is extremely non-standard. And so you already have low resource, you already have very mixed numbers of way of writing the same words. So it's very hard to know what your vocabulary actually is. Um, it's often Romanized compared to the original script. All of the Indian languages, um, when they're uh, written as code switched, um, all Romanize everything. And people are not very careful there. It's sort of interesting. People are very good even if they don't do it very often at writing in the regional language. But when they go into writing um, code switch stuff, they don't care about the spelling anymore in either language. So if they write English, they get the spelling right, but if they write code switch, it's much more noisy. Um, so all of our standard embedding techniques and all the way we train con um, contextualized word embeddings just are not appropriate for the data because now you have not only do you have effectively, because it doesn't know, random mixed language juxtaposed to your words? So that's not, that's going to be at the edge of your contextualized word embedding um, uh, um, accuracy. Um, BART was never trained on that. It takes nice um, language. MBART was never trained on that, but it's multilingual. Yeah, but it's multilingual with monolingual. And all of the, um, the only Indic language in MBART is Hindi, and it's all in Devanagari, it's not in the Romanized. Yeah, there's going to be some Romanization in there because there just is even in standard English, but realistically, it's not trained on that type of data. And one of the other ones, multilingual, Roberta, is trained on more mixed um, language and in Romanized, um, and so it's a little better. But in general, they're not very good at that, okay? Remember, it's casual speech. And actually, monolingual casual speech is hard to do as well. 
and now we have two languages and we have to have some way of actually trying to identify that. So that's why it's hard. It's hard sort of double plus hard um, because it's casual language we don't normally care about and it's got mixed language in it. Um, uh, so it's often hard to find. Um, it's even harder to verify. Um, actually, if you look on Twitter and things like that, um, you often find bilingual um, uh, things where you get something in English and something in Chinese, and it's a translation. It's because somebody is broadcasting to two communities. And so you don't just look for data that's got the two languages in it. You've got to make sure that it's actually code switched rather than translation. And unfortunately, often the bilingual stuff is slightly better written. So it, you can get confused with that data a little bit um, more rather than the code switch data. So that makes it harder. It, it is there in Twitter, YouTube, um, Reddit, and um, social media is where people are going to do it, but it's not labeled at all. Um, and finding it is a non-trivial research problem, okay? So it's not something about find data, train model. It's a matter of, I'm going to have to do my research on how to be able to find data. And I'll go into some more detail about that in a minute. Um, so uh, you need the right environment. Um, a, uh, to have people actually code switch, they don't do it all the time. And there's probably multiple ways of doing code switching. So it's not just, oh, it's got Hindi and English in it, it's code switch. Well, it depends on what people are doing, uh, whether they're arguing about some very technical thing or whether they're arguing about some non-technical thing, they're probably going to do a different type of code switching. Okay. Um, uh, where do we get data? Well, there is all data um, uh, collected. There's a now almost annual speech text workshop. Actually, we're trying to make this um, into an actual annual workshop, uh, but that has been the case for the past couple of years um, at probably ACL Interspeech, although every year one will be sort of text focused and the other one is speech focused. Um, there is a, um, a survey paper done by Sunyana Sitharam at Microsoft um, a research, there's the link there that talks about an awful lot of the data, although we have to update that paper. I'm one of the authors on it uh, regularly. Tamar um, from um, uh, University of Houston has been doing this, probably concentrated more in text than speech, um, uh, particularly in Spanglish, but in other languages as well. Um, she's been the lead on the, the, um, on the um, uh, the uh, text uh, workshops and code switching for a number of years. Um, it's growing, but it's still there, but there's only a relatively few number of language pairs that people are looking at. And really, we want to look at more because although we look at Spanglish, English, and Chinglish, um, actually it happens all over the planet. And we don't just want these bigger ones where we want solutions that are not just let's go and collect all the data. We want solutions where we're actually going to be able to bootstrap. Um, code switching um, tasks that we want to do, clearly language ID, we want to know which words are from which language, and it's sometimes hard. Is the word doctor, is that an English word or is that a Hindi word? Or the word lakh, L-A-K-H, is that an English word or a um, Hindi word? And the answer is a sort of both, okay? And numbers are hard as well because they're sort of both. So labeling is hard and speech actually what happens is the pronunciation of an English word in English is different than the pronunciation of that English word in Indian English. Okay, so people modify what they're and that happens in Spanglish as well. And so it's not that it becomes completely um, uh, into the um, other language, but there's some in between form. And so we have to be able to uh, address that. How do we do speech recognition? Language models are a real pain when you know, we don't have good examples to train on, but I should give a shout out to Google's Indian English ASR. It's actually really English ASR. So if you stuff actually Hindi at it and certainly English at it or Indian English at it, it does pretty well. And actually the group at Google spent a long time trying to get good language models. And so that works pretty well. Code switch synthesis is sort of reasonable. There's been challenges over the last few years. And actually my own group has been doing this for some time and we're getting quite good at it. Though we are not good at spelling normalization and we're not good at doing it all from romanization. If it's nicely written in Devnagari in English, we do very well. But if it's actually written in 
basically random spelling, it doesn't work as well. Um, spelling normalization, um, a, well, um, spell checkers absolutely don't work. So people don't care anymore or something, but the spelling is particularly bad. And um, even though the people can spell who are writing it, they stop worrying about it when they're actually doing code switch trials. So now you have much more noise than what you really need. And so this is already a language that you don't have much data in. And now the words are written in 37 different ways. And so that makes training even much harder. It puts noise into the data. And so already you're getting more. Often, especially in Indian um, subcontinent, um, the, the regional language is Romanized. And there's multiple standardizations of those, not both anglicization, but just techniques. And sometimes people care about putting the H in for aspiration. Some people care about the double vowels and some people don't. And they may not even standardly do that. So um, pause tagging, we'd like to be able to do part of speech tagging. Um, and there are some data, but they're very noisy. So you're not going to get 97% ever in that data because there's probably more than 5% error in the labeling. Okay. Um, also, detecting the matrix language can be really important. So your standard trigram part of speech tagging or local context may not be enough to do what you're doing. You want to know is when I'm, uh, I'm in a Hindi matrix sentence and therefore I want to sort of change my uh, weights um, or I'm in an English matrix um, sentence. So I want to change my weight distribution. And so you want to find ways to be able to do that. Um, Named entity recognition is a little bit higher up the scale of trying to understand things rather than just look at the words. Um, we've had challenges in that form, but we'd also like to get cross-lingual entity linking um, between the different ways of naming things, and especially between the reduction forms. You might get an introduction in the full form, which might be in its native form, um, whatever that is, English or Hindi. Um, and later, you might refer to it by another name or a, a, a nickname within the other language or some shortened form of it. Um, and that can be hard to be able to do when there's cross-lingual aspects of it. Um, sentiment analysis, we already said that it's pretty interesting to do that, but you can get actual cross-lingual aspects that are appear in that. Question answering, um, uh, um, Kathy Chandu in my group has done and has a data set on both English, Tenglish, and Tamlish, so Telugu English and um, Tamil English. Um, and it does things like use pictures to be able to collect some of the um, uh, data so that it doesn't influence people with the particular um, uh, um, lexical items. And that deserves much more work because that would be useful. People really do type in um, uh, code switch forms into Google and Bing. Um, a, a, a natural um, a, a, a language inference where you have some context and you have something you want to know whether it's true or false is one of these higher level things that we do in English. There's now a data set come out of Microsoft um, a, in India, um, which they took data from Bollywood movies, which are still a little performed. Um, and they took the scripts and they generated forms and there's a data set for that and it'd be nice to get more. Dialogue processing, so you actually use it in a dialogue in appropriate forms. Um, uh, Yuli and I have had a number of students going through that, including Tanme, who's um, TA here, and Emily Ann, um, who's now at UW, um, uh, with this common Amigos data set where we had a machine talking to people and trying to encourage Spanglish in Emily's case and um, Hinglish in Tanme's case. Um, and we do collect data and do find out what people do in entrainment, etc. Um, uh, um, we like to be able to do more um, when do people use it and so we'd like to be able to generate appropriately and we've begun to do some things in that but let me talk about that um, a little bit later so what are the four things the techniques that we can actually do I'm sort of running out of time um, so finding data is a research thing. It's not a prerequisite. It's actually a non-trivial research thing. And it's a really interesting thing. And if you can come up with good techniques to do this, you know, you can get a PhD at the moment in code switching with no problem whatsoever. Um, uh, usually implies casual speech. So you have to find things. YouTube is great, but it's, you know, and Google Indian English has helped, but we want to do it with other things. But you're probably not going to find your broadcast news, your Bibles, Korans, or um, other religious texts, which is Unix manuals, um, uh, won't have code switching in them. 
Okay, well, the manuals will have code switching in them because there'll be a lot of English. Um, Reddit is good or whatever the local equivalent is, but mining for data is hard. It's rarely conversations and yeah, you could get utterances, but there's a lot of context in, in Reddit. There's a lot of standardization within the actual groups. And so you can't just mine for every time that there's a, a sentence that's got one English word, at least one English word and at least one Hindi word. It might not be English. Um, Twitter Weibo is also very rarely conversations. It's usually one-off things with maybe okay or yes coming back. And you have to be very careful about bilingual translations, which actually might be in there, there at all. In other research, we've actually used that for boosting um, just-in-time translation, um, but that's not code switching. Okay, Labeling, bootstrapping, um, we can do um, code switching. Um, oops, sorry, it said the same thing in here. Um, uh, um, uh, um, oops, that's not the right slide. But bootstrapping is basically you label the data with um, some small amount of data. You then build a classifier, and then afterwards um, you uh, will uh, use that classifier on more data, and then you use the high confidence data to be able to get more data, and you keep doing this. It's very hard to know that you don't go into some weird subset of the data that isn't actually where you want to be. And without good downstream tasks, it makes it harder. Uh, I'm not going to change that slide now, but it'll be changed on the thing that appears online later. So you can uh, have a look at that. Data augmentation. Um, so this is another thing that we do. We try to generate more code switching data from the examples that we actually have. And a number of people are doing research in this area to try to get something that looks like proper code switching. So um, again, you build classifiers to distinguish between real and generated data. And all of the false positives that you can't distinguish, you can add to your base data. But again, that might not get all of the variants of the data that you actually want, because it might only get the easy ones. Um, uh, but it has been sh shown to um, work and it gets used for both language modeling and maybe even could be used for improving word embedding or maybe as a bootstrap way to involve word embedding and be able to get better classifiers for things later on. But it's sort of hard to test without having really good test sets at the end to evaluate whether these things are not going in some stupid direction or ignoring some substantial subset of the data that you'd really like to be able to get. Also, people that look at slightly more targeted paraphrase techniques. So maybe you could go in and replace named entities or maybe modify just one word and do a translation of the word into the other language. So you modify the amount of code switching. This often works, especially as most of the training techniques that we do are very surface oriented. So they're based on the words. They're not based on low level understanding of what's going on. And therefore, um, it can be it, this can work, um, uh, but again, you have to be careful that you don't overdo it and you have to have some way to test that. Evaluation techniques. Um, well, um, it's very good to test on held out data as we normally do, but that doesn't really tell us whether we're improving code switching, natural language processing, understanding. Uh, we don't yet have lots of high level tasks like dialogue understanding, summarization, question answering. So it's sort of hard to be able to really know where the things are getting better. Uh, Microsoft India, um, uh, Kanuja and others there have built a glucose, um, which is a standard data set for looking at um, code switching um, models that cares about uh, following on from glue in BERT, but for code switching. Um, and there was an ACL paper um, last year about it, but that's a public thing that people are working on and trying to improve because it's good to look at those. Though most of the tasks in there are still relatively low level and they're not up at the um, dialogue understanding, summarization, question answering type thing, because we don't have data for that yet. So um, what I've talked about um, is um, uh, today is multilingual is much more varied than just looking at another language. It's also looking at mixed language. This could be code mixed. This could be pidgin. This could be Creole. Uh, many techniques would be used for all of them, but um, a, a code switching is probably the rising one because it's the one that's probably got the most um, data at the moment. Pigeons and Creole, by sort of by definition, are a little bit more fixed. So maybe you can find them. There are Bibles and news reports often in there. Um, the issues are the same as dealing with monolingual. Um, casual speech, but now we have multiple languages to actually care about. 
And finally, the discussion points for the code switching part on um, today are select two languages that you have some competence in or know something about. And what I'm interested in is I want you to start looking at types of code switching, okay? So um, that happened in that particular pair of language. So I'd like you to sort of come up with a typology, okay? And this might be matrix language distinctions. That's a very obvious one. You can get that one for free. It might be cross-lingual morphological issues where um, uh, the plural changes. Um, um, it might be style um, level things about politeness. We heard about this in Telugu with plurals and non-plurals having something to do with politeness. Um, and that's something you have to be careful about how you use you uh, between them, but there could be other things. Uh, there also could be things about gender that goes across. How, what do you, how do you use a pronoun when you've introduced the word in English that does not have gender, but you have gender in, in the pronouns. It could be low level semantic distinctions. It's a better word to describe it and there's not a good translation or not an exact translation. But also there can be much more subtle things about city, educated, um, rural, um, international. And there could be other forms. And think about those two, okay? About what that difference, what these differences could be. Okay, so um, that's it for today. And we'll have, as usual, a question time 10 minutes before the, um, the, the language in 10.